Okay. So what I want to do... Hey! Let's do class or something! If I have to yell, I'm going to lose my voice, and then we won't have class, and I'll be sad. Anyway, so I want to kind of back up a little bit, because I, I caught myself kind of pressing the accelerator a little bit more quickly than I, than I, than I wanted to at the end of last class. So we're going to back up a little bit, and we're going to point out a couple of theorems that are useful for us. And then uh, we're going to go back to the example that we, that we did at the end of the class last time, but with a, a more solid idea about how this stuff works. So, can somebody remind me what Cauchy's theorem says? What was Cauchy's theorem? The way that we wrote it. What were the hypotheses? What was the conclusion? It's gotta be, I can't hear you. I'm up here, this room is echoey. You have to speak up. F is analytic. Okay, so we know F is analytic. Okay, so we need a simply connected domain. Okay, so we have C being piecewise, smooth, simple, and closed. And I assume that that's inside the domain. Inside of you. Okay, good. Okay, perfect. Okay. So this is Cauchy's theorem. And uh, actually, before we get started, I want to point out that Cauchy's theorem actually holds for non-simple closed curves. That's going to be something that we use today. And I'm curious if anybody sees why. So like, if you had, say, say that like, I want to be able to delete that word right there, right? The idea is that's an unnecessary assumption. It's very nice when you set the theorem up originally, but we don't need it. Yep. Well, you only care about the start and end point, right? So. That's true, but like, but the start and end point here, that, but we proved all of that under the assumption that the curves that we had when we put them together as loops didn't intersect themselves. Yep. Can you make a simple closed curve around the non-simple closed curves always? Yeah, but that doesn't show that they're equivalent to each other. We don't yet have a theorem that says that integrating around one closed contour is equivalent to integrating around another one as long as we're in the same simply connected domain. Yep. That's the way to think about it. So suppose that you had a C1 that looked like this. So there's curve C1. And you have uh, like a closed loop like this that's C2. So the way that you think about it is, well, that's a simply closed curve. And so the integral on that curve is 0. And that's a simply closed curve. So the integral on that curve is 0. And so the sum of those two, essentially what you do is you relabel everything. You say, oh, well, really, this is a curve D1, D2, D3, and D4. And then you look at the integral around the loop that, that is D1 and D4. So the idea here is that the integral around C, around the whole contour of F, is actually equal to the integral that goes around the loop where you do D1 and D4 of F. And then you add that to the integral where you go around D2 and D3. I have to, I, you have to be a little bit careful with orientation, but that's the idea, right? Is that you can decompose loops like this into smaller loops. Now, what that does not answer the question of is what if the curves intersect each other infinitely many times? So I'll leave that to you to think about. What if, what if they intersect uh, infinitely often? So I'll just I'm gonna leave that as an open question. But what I want you to think here is that like this simple is not a requirement for Cauchy's theorem. Okay. Any this is gonna hold for any closed loop. Yep. Is that like related though to what you were kind of talking about last class, where we can split like a something like that up into little pieces? This idea of chopping things into smaller pieces we're gonna see over and over again. So yeah, yeah. we're gonna the, but the idea of yeah, taking something complex and breaking it down into into sort of elementary pieces, we're gonna see that again today. Because the next theorem that I want to say that I want to show you is what's called the circle contour theorem. Okay, so the circle contour theorem is so we're going to use this when we prove the circle contour theorem. Okay. Um, 
or something like it. So the circle contour theorem says the following. Uh, if you have a contour C1, say oriented positively, and you have a contour C2, say oriented positively, and let's suppose that both of these curves uh, are inside a domain on which some function is analytic. A million markers, probably some of them work. So suppose you've got some U here. So here's the set U. And let's make the assumption here that F is analytic on U. So what I'm going to argue is that the integral of f on c1, on c1 is equal to the integral of f around c2. So those are, the, 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 that's the same integral, right? In fact, u does not have to be simply connected in this theorem. It just has to contain the two contours. All I need is that u is some analytic set containing both of the contours. So it's kind of a loose theorem in that sense. This theorem holds for non-simply connected domains. And that means that even if there was a hole in the center of the domain, we could still do this move where we have some contour integral and we want to reduce it to an integral around a circle because those are easy to work with. So the theorem says, this is called the circle contour theorem. Is, Johnson, what's that? Question, maybe this just isn't making sense, but um, is U non-simply connected at a single point or non-simply connected everywhere? It just, so non-simply connected is a global condition, not a local one. So okay. non-simply connected means there's just some loop inside, there's a hole in it somewhere. So okay. the, the, we're admitting the possibility there, that U has one there, or many holes in it. Is it finite number of holes or infinite holes? It can be finite. Okay. We can have, I mean, there's a whole study of things called multiply connected domains, right? So we're just, for now what I want you to think is, if there happens to be a point deleted or a, a disk deleted from the, the domain, it, this, would, this theorem still holds. Because okay. basically we're going to be working around deleted points mostly. Okay. The circle contour theorem says that if C1 and C2 are... Simple closed contours. Again, the word simple here may or may not be required. Let's just do simple for now. Simple closed, smooth curves in a domain U on which F is analytic. Then the integral around C1 of F dz is equal to the integral of f around <coughs> c2, which is kind of nice because it means we can replace one simple closed curve with another one, right? Yep. <coughs> However, this doesn't hold if the deleted points were enclosed by c1 but not c2. Um, I mean, yeah, because what what you need is like you need both of these sets to sit inside the same. Uh, well, no, I mean, if there was a deleted point out here. Mm -hmm. It would still be okay. Yeah? It's still... Now that's a good question. Is that true? No, because we passed through a singularity if we did potentially. So, no, because, because F wouldn't be analytic in the... It, we, all we need is that F is... We need F to be analytic on the set that contains them both. So there's not going to be some point... Uh, that would be okay for a point to be deleted as long as it wasn't an asymptote. The asymptote is the issue, not the, not the deletion of the point. Okay, yep? Do the curves, do they have to surround like the... They don't. They, they could just be, it could just be like a, a simply connected set with two curves inside. I mean, the, the upshot of this theorem is whenever you're doing a contour integral, you can replace it with a, with a circle. If you have a function and you have a contour and another contour, and they're connected together, like sitting both inside a set on which the function is analytic, you can reduce one to the other. Do they have to like, keep surrounding in discontinuity? Yeah, I mean, so like this is where I think Johnson might be a little loose with the way he's talking about this. He may actually mean that like the, the, the set is simply connected, but this is not true of simply connected sets. It's so, like, I, this, I, I have to think about this. It may be the case, like, that if they're going to surround a mutual discontinuity of the function, that they, they both have to be around it, right? So let me think about it. Can 
That's what I was kind of getting at earlier. It was like, is it possible to connect everywhere? Basically, what you need to, you you, what, to what, you need, curve, what you right? need to be able to argue is that it, that you can disconnect this thing into something simply connected, right? So, right. So for now, for now, let's make the assumption that for now, that if there is a hole in the function, it's in, it's interior to the two curves. Okay. So we're going to add. Well, the objection that's been raised here is that there's something that could happen if there's a hole outside of one curve and inside the other one. So let's say if there is a hole, if there is a hole in the domain, let's assume that C1 and C2 both go around the hole. That seems like a reasonable assumption to make for now. I'll revisit and see if this is an error in Johnson's textbook. It's a good observation. OK, so the question is, why is this true? Why can I, you know, assuming that we've got the right sort of analytic, like conditions of analyticity, why can I do this? You actually do need it to be connected in the interior, because what we're going to do is we're going to disconnect. We're going to take this set between them, and we're going to disconnect it into a simply connected region. OK. So this is one of these dumb, con so th this is a proof by drawing a contour. So here's C1, and here's C2, it's inside of it. And I want to argue that I can use Green's theorem. I can use the same idea that we used to show the Cauchy theorem. I can use the same idea to show that like this integral is true. So here's step one. I'm going to make a new contour here. I'm going to draw a point A and a point B. And I'm going to pretend that, the cur that I've got a new contour C, which is in which I do the following. That contour is going to be do C1 first, and then travel from B to A along the line from B to A, and then do the backwards direction of C2, and then come back along AB. I want to have the backwards direction of C2 because my argument here is that this contour surrounds in a positive oriented way the interior between these two things. So if you want a picture of what's happening, you imagine you do C1 and then you go from B to A along this line and then you go backwards around C2 so that it's oriented so that the curve, the inside of this is to the left and then you go back out on AB. OK, so that, that is actually, a, we've now made the interior of this thing simply connected, right? The interior of this set, all this stuff in here, this is simply connected. And so yeah, so I think, Madeline, the, 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 you, have, you have to be able to make the assumption that when you do this disconnection, you result in a simply connected set. Yep. If there were holes in between, couldn't you take your AB? Like through the holes to make it connected. That's a good question. So let me, again, let me think about like what you would need to do to beef it up, right? Like for which this applies. Do you have a follow up? Oh, I guess just another question. The, the example drawing there, C two is entirely region one. Yep. It's not a requirement there, right? So I mean, it's it's not generally like we almost always it's going to be the case that yeah. So really, what this argument is is again, you can pull this apart into pieces on which this is true. The argument is easiest to show in this picture because I'm going to be doing a one-time application of Green's theorem. And then you can imagine that if you wanted to do a more complicated intersection of contours, then you could, you could further decompose it into pieces that look like this. So you're right, yeah. You, you, you could do this with contours that intersect each other. Basically, if you know any topology, basically, as long as you can homotope one curve into the other, then you, then you have the same integral. If you can continuously deform this loop into that one, the integral doesn't change. Yeah. Yeah. So the continuous deformation means you, you have to be able to continuously deform one to the other. OK, so, so what? So I have a simply connected interior. Well, if you think about it, this is the same exact argument we used in the setup for the proof of the Cauchy theorem. So I can invoke Green's theorem now. Right? If you actually wrote down the integral of f, on the boundary here, if you wrote down the integral on C of F, that same Green's theorem argument where you replace the, the, the integral around the boundary with the integral on the interior, because F is analytic and the interior is simply connected, 
f is zero on the interior. And so this same argument that you use in Cauchy's theorem, so by Green's theorem, the integral on C is nothing. It's the same integral on the boundary is equal to the area integral in the interior, but the function was analytic, and so it represents a conservative vector field, and so everything cancels out once you do the Green's theorem application. On the other hand, the way that integrals work with contours is an integral on a big piecewise contour breaks into integrals on all the pieces. This is also equal to the integral on C1 of f plus the integral on BA of f plus the integral on minus C2 of f plus the integral from A to B of f. But the fundamental theorem of calculus says that if I'm integrating backwards and forwards on the same line, that they're negatives of each other. So the integral of f from b to a and the integral of f from a to b on a straight line, they're just negatives. So they cancel. So we get the integral on c1 of f plus the integral on minus c2 of f. Oh, but the integral around c2 going backwards is the same as the negative of the integral of f going forwards. Subject. Well, I was going to say, like, I don't want to keep coming back to, too much to like, what we were talking about, but like, the example that you did the other day with the z plus two, I think, or the z plus two. We're getting there. Like, we're coming back to it. Like, that does, I think, relate to what we were talking about. Because if you have like, a singularity, right? Q, I, and A. Yeah, but we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to disconnect the function first. Yeah. See, that's the point is yeah, yeah. that, so the point of the, the, so why this links up to the, the exercise I did last time is that was a function with two singularities, but I rewrote it as a sum of functions, each with one. And so we're actually letting ourselves slide the curve in around one and then the other separately, which, yeah, it's, it's a salient point to what you're talking about. I promise I'll get back to it. Okay, is it clear what, this, that, like what I did right here? I said that those canceled out. This is just the old integral from A to B of F is equal to minus the integral from B to A of F. Reversing the integral reverses the, the, the sign, right? That, that's true for any contour integral. If you reverse the direction you parameterize the curve on, you take it the negative. Well, that, that, that's it. That's the answer, right? Because now the integral on C1 minus the integral on C2 is 0. And so we conclude that the integral on C1 of f is equal to the integral on C2 of f. So if I can push one curve to the other one without passing through a hole, then I can replace the bad contour with an easy one. This is one of the places where I have, a, I have quite a bit of feedback to give Johnston. So, <laughs> Anyway, is it clear what's going on here? I know this is sort of, I'm not trying to wave my hands. This is not really a hand wavy argument. If you buy that this integral is zero because of Green's theorem, which is the same way that we did the other one, then you should buy that I can do this just by the basic rules of integration. So what, why, why does that matter? So let's actually do an example that leads up to the example I did last time. So let's look at this problem. Let's look at the integral around C of 1 over z minus a dz, where C is any contour with a on the exterior, which of course we assume exists by the Verdun curve here. Okay, so again, integral around C, and A is sitting on the outside. C is any contour with A in the exterior. So the picture here is there's some curve C, and there's a point A floating around out here, which is the place where that function has an asymptote or a singularity. What is this integral equal to? Zero. Why? Analytic on the interior and through, right? So the cauchy gorsoff theorem says it's equal to zero. It's a one-line argument. This is zero because can you surround this curve with a set on which f is analytic? Sure, its singularity is way out here, right? So as long as a is on the exterior of the contour, there's certainly an analytic domain u that surrounds the curve. This is what we mean by analytic through, like the inside and across. So this integral is equal to zero. The integral around c of 1 over z minus a dz uh, is 0 for this setup. What if I do exactly the same argument, but now I put a in the interior of c? So 
and I've got the integral things are on the board anymore am I off of it yeah that was uh, at some point I'll edit these videos and post them okay so now let's look at the integral around I don't know gamma of 1 over z minus a <coughs> dz but now where a is inside of the contour gamma so now I've got a gamma and I have a inside of it. What's that equal to? Yes, why is it equal to 2 pi i? You don't know the residue theorem yet. <laughs> because, well, I just taught you the circle contour theorem. Yeah, basically what you say is this integral, so the integral over gamma of 1 over z minus a dz is equal to the integral around, I don't know, should we call it something nice? Like, how about the circle where it's all z's where z is equal to a plus r e to the i t, or some sufficiently small value of r. What we're saying is, I don't need to integrate around gamma. I can integrate around some little circle around gamma where every point on this looks like a plus r e to the i t. And we already showed that that's equal to 1 over 2 pi i by direct parameterization. OK, so two cases, right? One case the cauchy gorsau theorem does not apply to, and one that it does. So we spent a lot of time last time uh, with me terrorizing you guys with partial fractions for a second, just for a second. There's a lot more terrorizing with partial fractions coming in the future, but not yet. OK, so basically, this is all we need now to handle this argument. No residues. I don't really hear any Laurent series of residues happening yet. The integral, how do you even know that? What class did you learn the residue theorem in? Oh, yeah. That makes sense. Well, I mean, they get used in physics, right? So. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at the integral around the circle modulus of z is equal to 3 of the function. Oh my god, what was it? Z? Was it 2? What was on top? 2z over z squared plus 4. Was that the right function? So we started this last time, and I ran into a wall because I hadn't taught you the circle contour theorem. And I also hadn't calculated these two examples. I was trying to motivate this, but maybe doing a super crazy example is not the right way to motivate it. OK, so we start with that. What's that? And we, when we show this was equal to something. I have no idea what's going on out there. I can't hear <laughs> So we have the integral around z is equal to 3 of 1 over z plus 2i dz plus 1 over z minus 2i. So this carefully constructed function, we use partial fractions to derive that. Am I wrong? All right. And we used partial fractions, which I'll remind you is something you're supposed to know how to do. Actually, this is one of these things where if there are electrical, you know, any more than one electrical engineers in the room, partial fractions are your bread and butter because you live and die by the Laplace transform. So it's a... Okay. We're going to talk about that later in here, by the way. So. Okay. Uh, so partial fractions is what gets you here. Now, the rules of integration say that if you have the integral of f plus g, that you can split it into whatever value that integral has. It's okay to take the integrals and separate them. Right? That's one of the basic properties of integrals, is the integral of f plus g is the integral of f plus the integral of g. This is an important step here, because this is going to be what allows us to use the circle contour theorem. This is going to turn into the integral over that circle, 1 over z plus 2i dz, plus the integral, and I don't want to hear the answer to this, using anything other than the facts that we've stated on the board for right now. Okay. Oh, we just count the asymptotes. They're both order of one. Yes, I know. Okay. <laughs> I know. We'll get there. Okay. So 
why did this matter? Well, this function, this is this problem again, right? Because we have a function that has a, an asymptote, a singularity. I have to try to not say the word whole. So we have this circle, modulus of z is equal to 3, is what we're integrating this function on. And it has a singularity down here at minus 2i. But the circle contour theorem says that that's equal to an integral at a circle cent <laughs> centered around 2i. And I already know that that means that because the singularity is inside, that this integral is equal to 2 pi i. Now the reason we could do this is because this function does not see that 2i is the singularity of the other function. I can't do it here because if I tried to slide this circle around, I would have to pull it through a singularity of the function to do it. I can't do that. It's not analytic at that point. But what I can do is break it into pieces, each one of, each one of which is individually analytic. It almost feels like cheating when you do this, right? What's this one equal to? Well, it better be 2 pi i by the same argument. Because that function, you're integrating around that circle, and it has one asymptote at positive 2i. And so it also can be reduced to an integral on a circle, and that's that case again. Yep? What happens if you can't tell just by looking at it where you're <laughs> Your well, so here's the annoying thing about complex analysis. Okay, so in comp frequently in complex analysis, I can say you can do something, but you actually can't. Right? So, so do you guys know about like the insolubility of the quintic equation? Yeah. Like you can't. There's no algebraic way of solving. Tithi. You can't. If I write down, there's a quadratic formula, and there's a cubic formula. And there's, a quad, and there's a quartic formula. If you give me a fourth degree polynomial, I can write a formula down for its roots. Fifth and above, there's no guarantee that you can ever find that. So here's the irritation of complex analysis. The fundamental theorem of algebra says that every rational function will decompose into a pile of linear pieces in a partial fraction decomposition. But you're not allowed to know what the roots are to do the decomposition. So. How do people work around it in practice? They use numerical estimators to figure out where the roots are and then break up functions into approximate functions. Or you just choose families of functions where it's well understood how they, how they decompose. Or you just never work with anything. You ever notice that all physics is built out of quadratic functions? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, cubic functions and quadratic functions? <laughs> oh, and that's it. That's all there is. Because you can factor those. OK. Right, so it, it, basically this technique of decomposing, so you know, what was the strategy we used here? We sort of decompose the function so we can take advantage of simpler structures, right? We're, we're leveraging analyticity where we can find it. Yep? What's to stop me uh, huh. from being a, a smart ass and just drawing a circle wherever I want to be like, oh, look, it's zero. Well, because you'd have to pull through a singularity to do that. The function has to be analytic, right? So as soon as you start pulling this circle, and you pull it through the asymptote, you've pulled it through a set where, no, where the function's not analytic as you pulled it across, right? Got it. The function's not even defined here, so you can't do that. In fact, this is actually goes to something called the counting principle, or the argument principle that's going to show up later, which is there's something intrinsic to functions about the way the contours wrap around their singularities. OK, so this is the sort of conclusion of what I want to talk about last time. Is this OK? Yep. Something like this, if a function is like not analytic at more than a single like isolated point, right? So it turns out that we're going to be able to leverage. So the, the core, to give you an idea about why, so you might think, okay, this is this is great, you can do this, but like, what's the what's the broader application, right? So it turns out to be the case that the the families of functions that get studied in complex analysis are functions that can be approximated by rational functions. So. Analytic functions you should think of as being functions that can be approximated very nicely with polynomials. Not just any function can be approximated by polynomials, but nicely with polynomials. And one step above that are functions that can be approximated with rational functions. And so if you're approximating with rational functions, 
if you know the singularities in the function that you're approximating, you can always approximate with the same kind of rational function. So if you know that your function you're approximating has some pile of singularities, and normally there's just a finite number of them and you know where they are, then you can approximate them with rational functions and say, well, since the integral of the rational functions look like this, then as you let that tend to whatever you're approximating, the same value holds. Right, so this idea, I mean, the longer you do mathematics, the more you get, might get the idea that what we do is we discover what we can do, and then we just define away anything that we can't. Like, that's basically what we're doing here. We have this machinery of analysis. We're going to study the stuff we can work with, and it just turns out by magic that we can do interesting things with it. So yeah, there's a lot of questions about what to do in the case where you don't know that. In fact, there's functions that have singularities that don't look like this. There's functions like, you know, like e to the minus z, right? That has a singularity that doesn't look like any rational function. So what do you do in that case? So we'll talk about that too. Oh yeah, I mean this is the beauty of complex analysis is like this is already a patch job on, on calculus because calculus is defined so badly that they had to come back along after the fact and invent things like, oh, we didn't mean continuity, we meant uniform continuity. Oh, we didn't mean convergence, pointwise convergence, we meant absolute con uniform convergence, right? So like already real analysis, this complex analysis is a patch job to, to delete all the crap that the real analysts did and make it useful. <laughs> what? It's true. <laughs> yep. E to the minus z? Yeah. Uh, e, sorry, e to the minus one over z. Oh, okay. Yeah, you, you, have, you, have, you, you, have, you have to put the discontinuity, you have to put the discontinuity in the, if you think about the power series of e to the z and you replace all the z's with one over z's, uh, you end up with a one over z to any power you want. And yeah, I meant, I meant e to the minus one over z, not e to the minus, yeah, e to the minus z. No, I did not mean e to the minus z has a singularity inside of it. I was going to ask <laughs> I, I would have I would have looked at you and said, "Oops, I'm an idiot." So, it's a... okay. So the next thing that I would like to talk about is two theorems. So there's another problem in one of the theorems that we stated, and with the, like one last thing we have to fix here, right? So there's two things. We're going to prove an estimate that's basically the triangle inequality because analysts have one tool. So you know, every time we need a new tool, we just invent a new version of the triangle inequality. And uh, and then we're also going to talk about um, the patch that we need to do to fix the fundamental theorem of calculus. So what was the problem with our fundamental theorem of calculus? There was a weakness in it. So this is actually so here we go without consulting your notes. Can anybody remind me what the hypotheses were for the fundamental theorem of calculus, if you're brave? So the fundamental theorem of complex functions, part A, said if f is continuous, And, see, here's where the, here's, here's the, here's the bad assumption, right? If f is continuous and f has an analytic antiderivative. This is the stuff, this is what we want to get rid of. And f has an analytic antiderivative. And, you know, once you start seeing enough of these theorems, you start asking, well, what, what is that assumption doing there? Like, that's lame. What do you mean if it has an analytic antiderivative? Why can't we just assume that it has an analytic antiderivative? Because then I could just apply this to anything I wanted. If f is continuous and f has an analytic antiderivative, uh, then given the u and the contour c and the points a and b contained inside c, uh, you know, a c connecting a and B contained inside of U, then it was the case that the integral from A to B of f of z dz was equal to f of B minus f of A. But the problem is, we had to assume that f had an antiderivative to do that. And that's, that's kind of weak sauce, right? Because like, oh, well, you know, if, I, if it had an antiderivative, then I can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus as dumb. 
It would be nice to know that functions have antiderivatives and not make that assumption. <coughs> so would it surprise you to learn that analytic functions have analytic antiderivatives? I would hope that would not surprise you to learn. But I want you to think about how weird that, 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 that statement is. I'm going to tell you that every analytic function has an analytic antiderivative. And the first thing you're going to think is, why wouldn't you just integrate the power series? Right? Yeah. OK. And the answer is, do you want to show that the integral of the power series converges to the definition of the Riemann sum of f that you would have to construct? Can we just use like a similar argument to what you did with the derivatives to construct that? So that is actually a good question, because it turns out we're going to use the fact that f has differentiable to show that f is also integrable, which is a backwards ass theorem if you think about it, right? So f being analytic means that f is holomorphic, which means f has a derivative. But the fact that f has a derivative is what you use to show that f must have been integrable. Yeah, it's weird. It's backwards, right? It's like somehow differentiable functions are guaranteed to be integrable, which is like reverse land. If you want to think about, it, if you want to think about that in relation to what may, you may have seen in earlier analysis classes, is it harder for a function to be differentiable or uh, integrable? Way harder to be differentiable, right? The function has to be very smooth and, or like controlled to be differentiable. Much easier for a function to be integrable. In the land of real calculus, it just needs to be continuous, right? So the existence of the derivative, like this analytic derivative, imposes that kind of smoothness that we need. Yep. Um, no, I'd like to stop that uh, on the term complex functions. Yep. Part, part is, a. You, is you simply connected? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I did put it. I mean, I mean, this is with plus all the plus all of the assumptions, right? So this was. I was just supposed to. I was trying to focus on this, but yes, U is simply connected, and C is piecewise smooth. I'm making me write all these down. All right, is that better? I think I got it all in there now. I think. Okay, so let's prove a famous theorem called the ML inequality. I might just state this and let you guys prove it. <laughs> well, this one's kind of this. This one's technical and not in the, in the and the argument isn't very revealing. So you can also think of it as a triangle inequality. And what Johnson calls it is the crash through with modulus theorem. I mean, the reason that you call something crash through with modulus or crash through with, with absolute values is because it's the barbarian way to do an estimate, right? It's like, I have no idea what's going on. Take its absolute value, right? It's the worst possible estimate. Crash through with modulus. Okay, and what it says is it gives us a way of replacing f with, uh, with a bound. So when f is continuous on a smooth curve C, and f is bounded on that curve, then, OK, I bet I could give you the hypothesis and people would tell me what the answer is. The integral over c of uh, f of z dz in absolute value, after all, it's a triangle inequality. What's the first thing I'm going to do here? Well, you're clear. <laughs> all right, that was the easy part of my cup stack. Sorry, you guys win. OK, what comes after that? And the integral of the absolute value of f of z. Of course, I've got to be a little bit careful here because dz also needs to have the absolute value taken of it. You think about dz as being a quantity that when you parameterize on a curve is z of t times dt, z prime of t dt. And so we're going to call this the absolute value of dz. And this is where the absolute value of dz is equal to the absolute value of z prime of t dt. It's like the it's it's the um, uh, the distance component, right? So arc length basically, scalar arc length. 
All right, now can somebody tell me what the, now I've already given you a setup here. F of Z is less than M in modulus. So I'm gonna tell you the easy part of the next part. If F of Z is bounded above by M, and certainly this is true, what's that equal to? Arc length of? It's that arc length of C, which is like the curve. That's why L comes from the ML theorem, right? The M is the maximum of modulus of the function, and the L is the length of the curve. And this is frequently an incredibly useful uh, uh, move to make, right? Because what we're doing is we're estimating uh, a complicated, nasty number that's like coming out of this integral with like a boneheaded like, oh look, it's m times the length of whatever the curve is that we integrated over. Yep. Does that mean that like you can estimate most of complex values functions with integral over a well, you can ask. I mean, you can estimate the modulus of, of of what's happening, right? So yeah, I mean, typically this is a way. This is a way of when you work in modulus. Essentially, what you, for all my, you know, I'm trashing real analysis in here. But really, the reason you do this is because now you have like all the real analysis tools available, because you're working with real numbers instead, not just real numbers, but positive real numbers, or not at least not negative. So yeah, you, you can actually approximate, uh, it's, it's a very common move to approximate modulus of a complex function as a real value function. All right, so one consequence of this. Okay, now the proof of this, I encourage you to read if you want to watch, look, like re work your way through a bunch of algebra. Because essentially what it is is just you express M as capital A plus IB, and then you break F into its real and imaginary parts, and you just multiply a bunch of crap together and use the regular triangle inequality. Right? So this proof is basically algebra. And I'm trying to do the proofs in this class that I think have something to contribute to your understanding of what's happening. And I don't think that there's much there to understand except you plug a bunch of numbers in and do algebra. The next theorem, though, is an important one because the next theorem says, as a consequence, weirdly, as a consequence of this estimate. The fundamental theorem of complex functions part B. If F is analytic on simply connected domain U, Then F has a primitive. F has a primitive, I don't know why he insists on using that word, but antiderivative. F so that F prime of Z is equal to F of Z for all Z and U. It's the same word, right? Primitive and antiderivative are used interchangeably in this class. Yeah, it's not a primitive antiderivative. He means like this is a noun, right? Pr like part of speech, noun. Part of speech, noun. Okay, so I want you to tell me what it should be. You guys all know the fundamental theorem of calculus. What what should the antiderivative be? I give you an F, build me its antiderivative. The dumbest way you can think of. Yep. Okay, all right. All right, so proof step one. Okay, so what you're going to say is the integral of little f. Okay, but I actually have to define, remember, this is all defined in terms of, con the only tools that we have is contour, is contour integrals, right? I don't have any other notion of integration here to work with. I only have contour integrals. And even when you did it in calculus one, the connection between the antiderivative as a formal function that you took derivatives of and the um, uh, definite integrals 
ran through a second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? Or actually, the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, which nobody ever remembers. What is the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus? Calculus 1, Math 141, when they teach you integration for the first time, it's your first you know, third of the course, they teach you integrals, oh. they teach you the fundamental theorem, there's two parts. You just saw it. I was about to say it. Okay, so say it. The derivative of the integral of that. So d, um, d by, um, well, just the real version, just the real version. Yeah, so I can say x. d by dx of the yeah. integral. From 0 to x. Oh, you can even any a if you want. a to x of f. Of f of whatever. t, some yeah. other dummy variable t. OK, so you take the derivative of this function defined as an integral. And what falls out? f of x. So this thing, maybe you didn't realize it when you learned it, but what you learned when you learned that was this is how you build the antiderivative of a function. This is the construction that tells you that little f has an antiderivative because this object, if you took its derivative, you get the original function back again. This is the antiderivative of f. We don't normally write it that way because it's annoying and no calculus student would understand why we did that. But this proves that continue, when you prove this, you're proving that continuous functions have antiderivatives given by this formula. And then when you use that to construct all the power rule, the exponential rule, and all the rest of it, but the fact that there's even antiderivatives at all follows from this observation. So what is the antiderivative I'm looking for here? I can do, if I was gonna do this naively and say, okay, this is fundamental theorem of calculus. I'm trying to show that things have antiderivatives, so I'm going to build them. I could build it in exactly the same way. What should be true? What should capital F be equal to? Up here, this was capital F. What should it be here? The integral from some contour. So the picture you want to have here is there's a point A, maybe a point Z, and they're both contained inside of your domain U, and that's some contour that connects them, because this is the machinery that we've got, right? We don't have definite integrals, we have contour integrals. So I have to use this kind of setup, from A to Z, on some contour, of? Well, I'm going to probably pick F of not Z, but W this time, because Z is the variable of this thing. Z is moving around inside the region. So we're defining the function f to be the integral from a to that value z that you've picked along any contour. Right? That this function f of z is equal to this guy, which you also then immediately write down as a to z of f of w dw. F of big F of z should be equal to the integral from a to z. Of course, there's a problem, which is I've just asserted that it doesn't matter the contour that I chose. As soon as I wrote down the a and the z here, I'm asserting to you that the contour didn't matter. Is that true? It's analytic. How would you prove it, though? How would you prove that how you got from a to z didn't matter? <laughs> or, <laughs> there is a way, that, that is correct, but there's a better way to do it. <laughs> What if you had two of them? Oh, yeah. Right? What if you had a C1 and a C2 that got you from A to Z? I've got a C1 and a C, and then I've got some other curve, C2, that connects them. Why is the integral along C1 equal to the integral along C2? Because it's a loop, and the Cauchy theorem says that that's equal to zero, right? This would say, the fact that if you write down two loops says that if you integrate around one of them, and then you integrate around the negative of the other one, f of w dw, that you should get zero by the Cauchy theorem, right? It's analytic, after all. And the, in the integral of a closed loop inside of a region of analyticity is zero. And that proves, this is actually why at the very beginning of class I told you Cauchy's theorem didn't care about intersections. This can intersect an infinite number of times, and this result is still true, which gets to your every possible path version, right? Any smooth path that connects A to Z is always going to give you the same integral by that argument. So that's a well-defined function. There's exactly one value for each value of Z. 
next time what we'll do, so next time what we're going to do is, we have enough stuff now to do all of the homework, all the computation, and next time, this proof is actually an interesting proof, and we're going to go through it. Yep? I assume that is the general point.